Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. Today, I have return guest Keith Campbell on the show. I'm going to be talking about the <laughs> first time we met, the weirdest Here We Are podcast that there's ever been. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he's uh, the author of the brand new book, The New Science of Narcissism. And so that's what we're mostly going to be talking about. And one of the favorite subjects of the podcast, uh, personality research, um, probably generally we'll be talking about as well. But Keith, why don't you introduce yourself for the listeners and viewers? Sure. Uh, my name is Keith Campbell. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Georgia. I study narcissism. I study personality and uh New book is out, and I'm just going around talking to people instead of being locked at home, which is a pleasure. <laughs> well, you're still locked at home. You're just also talking with At least people. I'm talking to people. It's just <laughs> nice. It's just nice. You know, have you noticed anything? I, here's something that I've noticed about myself is I haven't been... Do I haven't been being a guest on as many like 2019 was a crazy year for me. I started this new show called Stand Up Science. That's mm -hmm. like uh, ha I have two scientists, a second comedian each show. Uh, been going way better than the live here we are that you did, which was a weird house party in the middle awesome. of nowhere. It was pretty fun. But when I showed up there, I was like, oh, no, what the hell is this? And I was so I mean, I was so fortunate that you were cool because. I was like, my guests are gonna be freaking out when they, and I didn't, I didn't know you. I didn't know like you were a chill guy or whatever. And and, and like, I walked uh, in and they were listening to Jerry Garcia, Jerry Garcia banjo <laughs> music. I mean, they were so hardcore. It was like. <laughs> it's like this is great. Uh, it was so. <laughs> it was so bizarre. I, I mean, can, can you imagine if I? I mean, it's not. It's not unusual for a stand-up comedian to get themselves in like bizarre, weird yeah. situations and venues from time to time. It's the only time that I had had something so peculiar happen with something science-related. Uh, I, I'm I'm sure there's others I'm not thinking of. That's the strangest one in my memory. Uh, but can you imagine if if we had known then that the next time we were to talk, it was going to be an even stranger, stranger. situation than, than that? Incredible. <laughs> So I've I've noticed this. So I I haven't. So I was super busy on the. I was in like three cities a, a, a week last year. I wasn't being a guest on as many podcasts as normal. I haven't. I've been super busy since quarantine. My everything flipped upside down. You know, my my touring's done. Trying to refigure out my yeah. my new life or whatever quarantine life is for me. Whatever. And so when I do find myself guesting on a podcast, which is like not even once a month or something like that since quarantine, I'm like, ah! <laughs> like I, I, I talk yes. so much. I'm just like, what are you doing? I'm listening to myself. I tend to speak in essays anyway, but I don't know if it's just like I'm so desperate for social interaction or what have you. But. Yeah, there, I've just been looking at the research and the people who are suffering the most, I mean, just not, I shouldn't say suffering, but the people who are, feel thwarted the most are extroverts. Ah. Because they're just, I mean, and I yeah. don't know how extroverted you are in real I, life. I, I, I mean, you... I, I rate, the last time I did a big five test, I, I rate in the middle because I'm an extrovert for a living I, right. and I'm an introvert offstage. 
Yeah, that's my guess. You're not you're 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 a little less in person, I think. And I've yeah. I'm just I'm very extroverted and it's just you just want to be out there talking and doing and moving and you can't. It's and it's hard for people. They're the ones breaking a lot of the rules, you know, sneaking around. It's just it's hard for extroverts. Yeah, yeah. I I uh, though that is I I mean, I've seen it I've seen it with people like um where uh i i'm i'm in wisconsin i came home when everything hit the fan i came to my hometown to uh i was like oh i'll come for a visit i never get to see my family i didn't at the time i hadn't talked with an infectious disease people or this was like really early on i was like yeah hunker down for two or three months or whatever and uh but anyway so i've been uh i've been spending a bunch of time with my family my mom's an extrovert she's so social and she takes covid seriously but when i see her out and about it's i I see these interactions where you you see that people know that they're supposed to be distanced and they're like trying to be but they keep on getting like closer and closer to one another Uh, it's for i i found it's pretty easy for me but apparently based on the 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 experience that i shared with you of when i when i get a chance to talk to someone i'm yeah. like bah, verbal uh, verbal vomit um it must be impacting me more than i realize because most of me is like oh i'm i'm exercising more than usual i'm getting to getting to read some uh, more than i get to on the road and i from a from an anthropological point of view, this is the most interesting experience of my entire life. Uh, forgetting yeah. about forgetting about all of the darkness um, uh, with the economy and and uh, and health uh, uh, related things. But if you forget about that, just people's people's yeah. behavior and reaction to this. Wow, what what do you what do you think? I, well, I mean, the one thing you bring up there is my guess about your personality. And you, you said we could talk personality, so I'm just going for it. But yeah, you, yeah. you're very high in, in trade openness. You yeah. know, just curiosity and novelty seeking. And and uh, and I, I am too. And this, it's kind of interesting to watch. I mean, I was in, a, I was with my kids over in, a, in Budapest when they had the shutdown and you know it was kind of empty and we were in the bath and then we were in Amsterdam on like the last cruise ship or second to last so there's one after us and it's like a it was like a zombie movie and you it were was on a cr- of, you were like, on a you know cruise those ship? canal you no know, those canal cruises in Amsterdam oh, you know oh, like okay. we went there and it was right when they shut down and I was going to take my kids to see Anne Frank house and the Van Gogh museum. And it, it all got <laughs> shut down. So we had one thing to do, which is, you know, drive, we went to the red light district and then took the canal cruise. And it was like an apocalypse. Yeah. And I was like, you know, hopefully we'll never see this again. I mean, yeah. it's kind of cool to see it, but I never want to see it again. My drive from California back to Wisconsin was <sighs> the creepiest, most beautiful uh, drive of my entire life the roads were empty except the only one on the road was also people like me so it was like their vehicles packed full of full of stuff and things all you, you know mattresses yeah, <laughs> tied down to the cars and stuff and it was so it was so mad max feeling but it, and, and it was gorgeous it was just yeah. beautiful weather and empty and and you know i i don't know if you've done that drive from la to denver uh, but uh holy it, it, smokes which like, i don't even depends which way you go they're like all beautiful, through, right? through vegas and everything it's just like whew. Uh, but and you do the pass like is it through the cascade or what no it's not it's a what are those mountains you wasatch pass or something you go over the big uh, mountain range to get over there yeah the yeah i think so it's but, just it's just incredible country right yeah, like, yeah. unbelievable <laughs> yeah, but so that's what's so interesting because on one hand, like the openness part is like, what a gift to see this. I can't believe it. I got to see the Rockies like the settlers did, you know, the Donner Party. And on the other hand, you're like, because it's a pandemic and it's horrible. Like and the suffering. settlers did. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry, I cut you off. 
No, it's just, it's kind of an interesting thing because yeah. part of it is kind of, like you said, it's kind of interesting to watch the catastrophe. It's kind of interesting to see this world happen. And, and, but it's, it's so, it's sad, it's, you know, so other parts of you are like really sad, but other parts are kind of engaged by it. It's just how we're wired, I think. Plus there's these interesting things of like, what is, you know, from an alien anthropologist point of view, uh, it, you know, the difference between like economics and behavioral economics, like here's what people should be doing. Yeah. This is what human behavior actually does. Even things like asymptomatic stuff that, that, that like, you know, we evolved with the inability to perceive such a threat. And so it's oh. not that startling uh, or, or or surprising that people have a really difficult time uh, wrapping their heads around this idea, or even even that maybe being responsible for um, you know conspiracy stuff or or whatever. Not not when you can't like physically see these things. Uh, ha it, you know, if people were hacking up a lung, everyone would be yeah. six feet apart. Every everyone would yeah. be covering their mouth. Uh, Ebola, it would be easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, easy. So. Yeah, I. You bring up this interesting old. It's like the old social psych thing, which it goes back to cognitive dissonance theory. That you have something you don't really see, you know, and that the dissonance theory went back to an earthquake in India. That it it it, it scared a lot of people, but the damage wasn't as apparent. And, and what they ended up doing was coming up with stories to make it, you know, because they had all this, you know, they had all this thing like, God, they had all this fear, things are really bad. And then they started filling it with stories. And that's kind of what happens is you, you put a big gap in there, you put a big gap, and, and people will just fill it up with stories, they have to fill it with something, you know, <laughs> I know, it, it'll get filled right up. Consciousness is spreading. so amazing too, oh. and, and it's always it's. It, I I think it's like uh, I I think sometimes the, the ideas that we can't cling to are the ones that are are almost selected for. But uh, I mean, we we have a thousand thoughts pass through our minds in a day. Often the ones that we notice or latch on to are these hyper salient, you, you know, like very dramatic types mm -hmm. of things that grab our attention and and once we get going with the narrative um it's pretty oh yeah and then you stop making movies and lock people in their room with nothing to do <laughs> i mean what do you expect i mean people are just going to make their own entertainment i mean <laughs> yeah. what else are they gonna do you know it, it's really i mean it, it, this psychologically is very unstable you know a lot of yeah. fear a lot you know a lot of no really clean messaging from people, uh, unstable or inconsistent messaging, you know, political conflict. This is just a recipe for, uh, I should say, eruptions or, or weird flame ups or just different things you could, it's, in, it's unstable, very yeah. unstable. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, well, maybe, Let's put a pin on in that and revisit that idea once we set everything up because I think that could be really interesting to I because I, I would I would love to hear about wh what you think about like some sort of traumatic or unstabil uh, uh, some instability instability rather in the in an environment some drastic shocking change in different how different personalities might respond yeah. and 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 especially maybe in terms of neuroticism. But I think at first we should, yeah. I'd like to set up neuroticism. I'd like to, we, we, we've talked about um, personality studies uh, at least like a couple times, uh, uh, two or three times a year I have a personality researcher on at least. That's not to say that everyone listening has heard every single episode. Yeah. But one thing that I can think of that we've never actually talked about is a little bit of the, you know, we've talked about the big five for listeners, conscientiousness, um, agreeableness, uh, neuroticism, which, 
you would say like that that's susceptibility to low uh, uh to like negative emotionality yeah or? i i some i think about it as like overly heightened threat detection so okay. you're kind of you're kind of i mean i sort of think of these things in the well, cybernetic way but but neuroticism is threat detection and so it makes you susceptible to things like anxiety depression hostility a lot of the clinical disorders are grounded in i mean the common ones are grounded in neuroticism okay uh and then there and then we got openness and uh and extroversion and i'm I, I'm, I'm typically in the middle of, or last time i took a test um middle of neuroticism exceptionally high and openness is my my most yeah. extreme my most extreme low conscientiousness i'm i'm a huge slob um and i'm a little low in uh, agreeableness I, I think that's pretty situational for me though um and probably is for a lot of people but i i one thing that we haven't talked about and i i think since the last time we've had a personality researcher i took a class on personality research and then in the beginning of your book you do a really nice job of talking about kind of how we landed on these categor uh, categorizations of like why is it five and, yeah. and what other ways of, of, of thinking about it are there and what is um what what are we uh, the the idea that you're you're taking all of these different the myriad of personality traits and and grouping them in these clusters yeah. into these kind of um, e easier to understand categories. Yeah. Um, so, and it's really, I mean, do you want me to talk about it for a second? Is that where you're going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's please, kind please. of kind of an interesting story because um, you know it goes back to back to um, uh, Sir. Sir Charles Galton back in the British days trying to figure out how to understand twins. And he said, you know, I, I need to understand people. Well, how do I categorize them? How do I make sense of them? How do I, you know, describe these people? And he thought, well, if there's a word for something, if it's an important way to describe somebody, it should be in language. I mean, we should have a term for it. If, if, some, if being weird is interesting or important, we should have a term for it. Um, if being stingy is something important, we should have a term for it. And so this idea became the lexical hypothesis that, well, if something's important enough, we'll have a word for it in the language. And so he started looking at a thesaurus and found these, that we had thousands of different adjectives to describe traits. And so there's lots of them and poets are really good at using these. They can use all these different adjectives in really nuanced ways, but it turns out that a lot of these are sort of similar. So saying somebody's nice and kind and caring and concerned and um, loving, they're kind of related ideas. And saying somebody is uh, creative and interesting and unusual and curious are kind of related ideas. They, they kind of group together. And so people started these projects of how do we group these traits together. And over, you know, the decades of doing this, people came at it through the language, through the lexicon. People came at it through traits, you know, looking at the in actual personality trait terms. People came at it in other ways. But they kind of agreed that five factors are really good. The five factors you described. Um, and to remember them, you, they spell ocean or canoe. That's, the, that's kind of the easy mnemonic. But here's what's really important. To, I mean, how we think about these traits is we think about they all relate. Um, they relate in this kind of universe called the nomological network. And they can all become, they can all be described at higher or lower, or lower levels of structure. So the big five can be reduced to kind of a big two or a big three or a big one. Can, and they can you, be, could you quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the big one is, it sounds strange, but it turns out that these traits correlate in a way that there's sort of a pattern of somebody who is a little bit high in extroversion, high in conscientiousness, high in openness, high in agreeableness, and low in neuroticism. That overall pattern of kind of what we almost call like healthy functioning in the West would be the big one. Mm. And if you break that down, that's sort of something we rarely use. 
But if you break it down into two factors, you have a factor that looks a lot like uh, drive or agency or power, uh, yang, uh, thanatos, I mean, or eros, thanatos. Um, There'd be different terms for this. And then another term that looks a lot like friendliness, love, connection, communion, yin. Um, So it's it's a two-factor model Mm. that we talk about it's almost a, it's basically yin and yang but it comes out we might i think about it as agency or sort of activity or drive or mm-hmm. communion another label is plasticity sort of the willingness to change the world versus stability that sort of the willingness to connect the world so you can think about these two meta traits that operate it just gets a little heavy um, but there's sort of one force that breaks things up and creates things and another, for, another excuse me, another force that stabilizes things. And those are nested in personality. Mm. And then you can go the other way and start breaking the factors down. So a trait like openness that you're high on has two aspects. One of those would be something like aesthetics or interest in art or you know kind of classic creativity and another would be something like intellectives which would be more philosophical thinking mm-hmm. and my guess is you're high in both of those but those are both important different aspects and then you can go you can go from two aspects to six facets so every one of the five factor traits has six facets and sometimes those get important, like there's a facet of conscientiousness called industriousness, which is sometimes we talk about as grit, which is really important for success in the workplace. So it's this kind of driven, you know, driven people who are organized and driven. Um, and then those, those facets can be broken down into what we call nuances which is really kind of how you describe the word. So so like in California, you know, we had 15 different ways that you could pronounce dude. And personality is the same, like he's mean or he, I mean, I don't know, mean's a good one. He's he's odd or he's odd. You know, it could be a little different nuance, like one's kind of good, one's kind of bad. So real, these things are almost like a weird, you can think about them structured like a telescope or a kaleidoscope, and you can look at them at any different level, just whatever is useful for the job at hand. I, I was a hair, spe, speaking of, uh, of neuroticism, um, I, I was like, I, I find myself doing a bit of me search with the podcast quite, quite a bit. And, and, um, and, so as you're talking about uh as you're talking about grit i was thinking where am i on that because i i would say that i'm a pretty resilient like i, I i'm not yeah. when it comes to like injury or failure or what like i i don't i i don't um i i keep going i'm ambitious but i also i don't mind just like on a day-to-day life i'll throw in the towel in a second, I got. I have. <laughs> I have no guilt about it. I, I'm. I'm very quick to be like, ah, what's the point in doing anything anyway? This is. A, <laughs> and, but, but I also believe in myself at the same time. But, so no, I. I I'll tell you what. So conscientiousness has two aspects, and one of them is really this organization or neatness or uh, kind of you know, whatever, I, whatever I don't do, being kind of <laughs> super neat and everything. And the other aspect is one that looks like more like, you know, kind of planfulness and getting stuff done. It's, it's, it's an industriousness. And what could be going on is you're, you're not, maybe not the most kind of classically organized person on earth, but you've probably got some ambition yeah. at the same time. I, it's a it's a combination I see with academics. That's why I'm sort of suggesting I have friends like this that are, you know, they're incredibly successful and, and brilliant. And then they just look like they rolled out of bed in pajamas and cigarettes <laughs> hanging out of their ears. And it's just, you know, those traits can, you can be a slop, you can be sloppy and, and, and kind of uh, successfully conscientious at the same time. They're just a little different aspects of the trait. Interesting. So how do we, how do we uh, define 
neuroticism what are what are the different kinds of neuroticism what are the um the 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 kind of personality scales that that lead to th this is I'm, I'm saying we can take as much time with this conversation as you want i'm just kind of setting up where i'd like to go uh i would i would love to figure out how much of a narcissist i am and in what way how could i be the best narcissist <laughs> I can possibly be for my given environment. <laughs> yeah, so like I said, neuroticism is this like central trait to a lot of uh, mental, uh, mental disorders that are common, things like generalized anxiety, phobias, depression, anxiety. But it also has a, a quality of hostility to it. So you can have this neurotic anger or neurotic hostility. So there's, there's a couple aspects of it. One that's more depressed anxiety and this little more hostile piece as well. Um, kind of the lashing out, maybe the lashing out in pain. Mm. So you can have different, so it, you can have aggression that's more kind of this reactive aggression that you see with neuroticism or more planful aggression. You might see that's more predatory and that might be something you see more with psychopathy or antagonism. Mm. Um, so I like to think of, I think of all these traits as being trade-offs. So I like to think they're, they're, there's a good side to them and a bad side to them or else we wouldn't have them. I don't like to think of anything as just purely bad. Neuroticism is threat detection. So people who are neurotic are really good at detecting threats. Now, Woody Allen, who played a great neurotic, was really good at detecting physical ailments that he didn't have relationship problems he didn't have. When his world was going right, he found enough problems that he just made it start going wrong. So it, it, it's, it's a, it can be thought of as a, a threat detection, but sometimes that's a good thing to have, you know? And being really low in neuroticism, it, it, it's a guardrail. And if you're, if you're really calm and you're not nervous, you just do stupid stuff because you got nothing stopping yourself. I've I have an album about breaking both of my feet from jumping off a, a thing that was too high while hiking. I've I've gotten a fair amount of injuries in life. I've gone to jail. I've been to a psych ward a couple times. I've done too many drugs. I've I, I've had I I could I could I I would have definitely benefited from a pinch more fear <laughs> throughout yeah. my life. I mean, so, so fear is a guardrail. Um, agreeableness can be a guardrail. So a lot of people will control their own risk taking because they're family. Well, I do that. I a lot of people, Shane, I don't know any of them except for me. <laughs> like, I just don't do as much stupid stuff because I got kids. I just can't afford it. So just relationships keep you from being stupid. And, yeah. um, and, and conscientiousness is kind of too. Some people are impulsive. They just can't help themselves. Yeah. But my guess is you're more sensation seeking because yeah. that would be something that's sort of extroversion, but lo loaded onto openness. So it's kind of, oh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. I'm, I'm kind of wired like that too. And you end up kind of finding yourself in dumb situations. <laughs> like, oh, man. Yeah. Um, I mean, mo most of my, just, uh, most of my friends that like know me well and they hang out with me or whatever, if we're going to um, say like, go camping or, or like go kayaking or take a psychedelic or any, any, anything, anything that's, that's even slightly adventurous. It, if I say so, I, I usually take charge in those sorts of situations. I'm not a take charge type of guy, yeah. but I, but I, 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 I can turn that on uh, when I, when I need to. And, uh, and most of my, most people that know me, I make them nervous and and they're usually like take half of whatever Shane does uh or or yeah. you know if, if Shane says to like go down this rapids or whatever let's let's ask some other people if it's safe first you know that yeah. tends to be the case yeah that is high sensation seeking now the note notice the difference between the two of us is my beard is gray 
And the <laughs> reason is when I go someplace, I hire a guy who's 25 and say, I'm the guy with the tip money. Make sure I come home alive. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I, I mean, I can't do that. So, you, yeah, you know, yeah. I really, you, I really will just find, I will protect myself because that's the risk. And, and again, that's not, you're not impulsive. It's probably a bit of just, it's fun. It's sensation seeking. And you end up doing things that you get over your skis, I guess is what we used to. Maybe that's a good Wisconsin saying. Yeah. Get out over your skis a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm usually, you know, not only do I not have a family, but even when I've been in relationships, which has been most of my adult life, I've been on the road alone quite a bit. And so n not many people to wrangle me in. Right, right. And that's, that's important. You know, that's an important thing. And if you had that, you'd probably end up changing your behavior. You know, people get married, have kids, they kind of become a little more conscientious and more. I mean, I was, I'd tell you, so I was in New Zealand fishing with my dad and we were on the, the last run of the Rangitiki River for this, this important detail everyone needs to <laughs> get it. <laughs> and uh, we were climbing to the last run and this, the, the Kiwi guy just kind of ran over this cliff and we start climbing up and we're in our felt sold wading boots. You know, you get no purchase with them. And, and we're holding on to these things and my dad looks at me and goes, you got a kid, I got kids, we got to go back. And that's the first time I just said, I'm going back. It's probably, you know, 36 or something. I'm like, I'm going back. And yeah. it hurt, but I did it. And that was a real, I did. I never fished the last pool in the Rangitiki. And it could have been legendary, but, <laughs> yeah. but I made it home, you know? So that's that yeah, kind of exchange yeah. you make, I think. Interesting. So I love, um, you know, I, I've taken a number of different tests on my show. I I I love as well actually what what I what I truly love is is like big concepts and just and just having philosophical conversations but I've learned over time I it, like I that I get rewarded for being vulnerable and so I don't really care about like personal stuff as as much as most people seem to like my for example my album about breaking both of my feet I had pretty much written the whole thing. It was all about the evolution of negative behavior and everything before I had broken my feet. And it was working. It was doing like well in a club. It was just like higher concept stuff. I would sometimes get some strange looks because people weren't expecting to hear about evolutionary psychology and biology or whatever in a comedy club. And then when I broke my feet and had like a personal story to attach it to, it, that's when it really took off because people responded yeah. to it so much and i and i feel like as a comedian we we get we get rewarded so much for like here's all the skeletons in my closet that it becomes this exhibitionist like almost a pavlovian um yes. feedback loop of, of making yourself more and more vulnerable that's interesting in a couple ways um one, because there's this study back in the day on narcissism and stand-up comedy has kind of high narcissism scores. Mm. You know, they're up there with reality television. And I thought about that a lot. I thought, my God, you got to be out there on a stage by yourself. It just takes freaking cojones. And you got to want it. You got to really want it. You know what I mean? And and maybe and and maybe some of that self-expression, though, is is kind of reinforced in the audience. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing I thought about is I have a student, uh, uh, Patrick, who studies YouTube videos and other sort of celebrities. And he found when people reveal stuff, that's something people really resonate with. So when people yeah. talk about themselves, the audience likes it. So you're probably getting conditioned, you know, this kind of classic, you know, reinforcement, like, I mean, oh, and this happened. And oh, my God, I did this. And, you know, yeah. just making up tragedies. I, I mean, I, I've talked about this once or twice on the show before i think but you're i think you're going to really probably find this interesting so i'll i'll share it with you again but it's i i think what happens is you go hey stand up comedy that sounds like a fun thing for me it was a childhood dream and and actually for me i i had terrible stage fright and everything but the, but there's there's actually being on stage is a safer place for me than um the normal social interactions because I plan out what I'm going to say. I have total control 
for the most part over the situation. I get to sound more interesting than I actually am. It's this selective self-presentation, sort yeah. of sort of like what we have with social media. And yeah, I was gonna say, it's like a giant website, you know, it's like it, a Facebook page. In a better. lot of ways, yeah. You just travel from town to town putting out this embellished <laughs> profile <laughs> of, of, who, of who you are. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, I, I think you know you you figure out I, I what I see I think this happened some with me but I've definitely noticed a lot of it in others where you know you figure out these joke structures of like set up punch oh you you build tension and then you do this twist and it makes it all okay and there's this release of the tension and that's cathartic and it may leads yeah. to a bigger level you figure out these mechanisms these formulas and you're getting laughs and then one day you have and and you're like doing these you know delightful absurdist jokes or whatever uh fun puns or whatever one day you have just a horrible day and now you have enough stage experience where you feel a little more comfortable on stage you get on stage you go like oh you wouldn't believe what my neighbor or my my significant other did or whatever and and you're, you're like kind of fuming and and it's not even like your joke structures are that you're just kind of riffing a little bit and there's something about it it's so genuine it's real in in a modern social situation this isn't the sort of thing that like the average person can talk about like at the workplace or around the cubicle or maybe even in their home life but they feel it they experience it they resonate with it and you get the biggest laugh you've ever gotten what the heck is this i didn't even put that i didn't even write that that wasn't even like that structurally sound of a joke and i just got the biggest laugh and i think subconsciously there's a thing that goes what did, what was i doing there oh i wonder i wonder what other <laughs> what other weird things about myself i can i can yeah. share Maybe if I make some more enemies and have more conflict in my life, that'll <laughs> make for better comedy. But you know, that's what those artists, I mean, that was kind of that old artistic model. If you go out and sow chaos in your life to make great art and stuff, ooh, that's <laughs> yeah. dark. Haven't written an <laughs> album in a while. We better throw something out the, the hotel window. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was. I always imagine like David Bowie, you know, just going to Berlin and doing coke and just making albums. And then somebody told me he went to Berlin to get away from the coke. Like it was, that was like escaping. It was so crazy. But yeah. but yeah, I do think people do that, right? They create the chaos then for the material to go out there and, and uh, get reinforced. Ooh, yeah. Mm. Um, so I want to go through kind of maybe how, how we test. So oh, one of the things that may, maybe you should first talk about the the difference in the the two main uh, neuroticists, the vulnerable and the grandiose. Oh yeah, I mean it's, it's pretty easy because we're kind of talking about it from a big five. Um, when we talk about the big five, and I guess to to sort of frame this, like just to nerd out a little bit, we think about all personality traits existing sort of in some proximity to each other. So things like a trait like neuroticism and, and uh, depression should be pretty close to each other, correlated. So meaning if I took a thousand people and measured neuroticism and depression and anxiety, all those things will kind of correlate. Mm -hmm. And I sort of think about the, you know, this network of traits we call the nomological network. It's kind of like stars in the sky and there's kind of the big five, but all these different traits we talk about can be placed in those traits. They're not different. They're all sort of, they overlap each other. Maybe think about it as ingredients, a different metaphor. Mm -hmm. So narcissism is really can be described as a combination or being placed in a combination of these big five traits. And if you come at it that way, what it is, is a combination of this sense of sort of antagonism, low agreeableness, callousness, lack of empathy, sense of entitlement. It's kind of all that's the low end of agreeableness. And then you add to that either extroversion, drive, ambition, confidence, all those parts of extroversion that make for great leaders and people you want to date and great actors and everything. So you kind of marry the antagonism with extroversion. 
And that leads to this grandiose form of narcissism, which is somebody who is extroverted and maybe charming and likable and confident and got some swagger, but also a little bit callous with a sense of entitlement, a little bit of a sense of superiority. Mm. And, and then when those basic traits, I'm going to get real nerdy with you guys. So you please, take those please. basic basic personality traits and you kind of filter those through the self system or self regulation. What happens is somebody who's a grandiose narcissist is like, I'm awesome. So I have to keep doing things that reinforce this sense of awesomeness. Mm -hmm. So I might get my posse of good looking people. I might, you know, show everybody my new podcast I'm doing to show how cool I am. I might get a lot of followers on Facebook. I might get a hot girlfriend. I might get a fancy car. But I do all these things to regulate the self. So those basic traits, when they enter the self, have to start becoming these sort of social processes that we see with narcissism. Bragging, showing off, attention seeking, you know, name dropping, all those kind of classic narcissistic things. So then that's the grandiose narcissist. For, for the vulnerable narcissist, you take that same or a similar core of antagonism or low agreeableness, that same sense of entitlement, the same, you know, the world has not treated me the way it should. But you add to that insecurity, high neuroticism. So you get low self-esteem, unstable self-esteem, um, anxiety, lack of confidence, interpersonal confidence. So imagine being a vulnerable narcissist. You're like, I'm a little better than people. I deserve special treatment but I'm kind of can't really talk to people very well. It's hard for me, but I, and so you end up sometimes with a big fantasy life. Like this is how that goes into self-regulation. You can't go out there and get a hot car and a girlfriend. So you fantasize about it. You start regulating through fantasy mm -hmm. and you get depressed because you can't manifest that. And then at the extreme end, you see sort of sometimes these sort of dark manifestations where people kind of crack and get into the world and, you know, become Internet trolls or something, you know, or even worse, because it's like a way to, to actualize this, this, this grandiose fantasy. Mm. So that's the, the vulnerable side is so that they share the core of antagonism, but you, you mix it differently with, the, with those with either the neuroticism or extroversion. You get these two different forms. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't. I, I think, it, if anything, I'm definitely toward the vulnerable uh, side of that. I have self-esteem issues and and everything else. I I have. Uh, I, I mean, how how much of this stuff changes through life history? Because I at least tell myself a story that if I'm a if I'm a narcissist. I think I'm a bit more self-aware than the average narcissist, yeah. but is that is something that a narcissist would would that think is a classic. of? That's classic. No, I'm the of, most of, self of, 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 of themselves. So, so I, I, you know, it, it is what it, I, I'm. I'm more than happy to learn new things about myself and figure out, what, for better or worse, what I what I am as a person. What it what it what it, it's one of the most amazing adventures in life is not like you know for me like rock climbing or whatever else it's like what is this experience so that i have what yeah. what am i and uh and so it, it, i'm curious how much this can kind of change with environments in over the course of a lifespan i remember being a uh, young man had a, i i had the idea of being a comedian be when I was like nine or ten, and then right around that age uh, was when I I felt uh, like very alienated from everyone else. I was raised religious. I didn't understand it. I thought I thought like either I was crazy or everyone else was. I didn't know there was such a thing as like agnostic or atheist or whatever. Uh, I I didn't. It was around the the time where. Uh, you know, started rebelling against parents and authority and stuff like that. Never liked teachers. I wasn't, didn't, uh, I, I either didn't pay attention or cheated in school and, and pushed boundaries everywhere that I could from a pretty early age. I remember being very depressed around that age. I remember telling myself stories of like, one day they'll see, I'm going to be a big shot. And like going off into these, 
fantasies of of uh you know getting on david letterman or whatever and <laughs> and well i'm supposed to be paying attention in class and then uh and and wanting to have more friends and stuff and and like kind of kind of thinking that i was like cooler than people were giving me credit for but at the same time super awkward socially like one of the shyest people you'd ever meet yeah. and uh and then when i when i became a comedian i had i i like my early career was like skyrocketed success i, I, I so, uh, plateaued like five six years in but early on it was like this exciting whoa everyone likes me i'm catching all these breaks i'm getting on tv and that was and i i had i got to taste like a bit of that like grandy i was like oh i, I am i just gonna be the biggest stand-up comedian there is or whatever and that was when i was like is this what i've been after my life the, this is so stupid it was it was just like embarrassing it was it, i was like why did i why did i want this attention why did i want this spotlight and it was and that's kind of when i started looking inward a little i always liked having big philosophical conversations mm -hmm. but that's that was kind of eventually what put me on the path to learning about psychology more and and those sorts of things so i don't know how much of that is still with me i think it depends on what day you ask me but i'm it those traits were certainly much more extreme early yeah. on in life yeah i i think that i mean i think that's really common you know when you're young first of all you know you're a young dude you got not you can't do damn things so you kind of got <laughs> fantasy and believe me i fantasize to be on, on letterman too i remember being a kid going you know maybe someday i'll have interesting conversations with people you know a, a lot of the reason i'm here is because i just wanted to have interesting conversations with people I just yeah kept working my way up the food chain you know and it just right. kept going and so I think that a lot of that's normal. And the other thing that's normal when you're young is just to be kind of full of yourself and, you know, kind of arrogant, kind of think you know everything. And I thought, I mean, it's the only time I knew everything. I was 18. I mean, that's just, that's normal. It's probably adaptive evolutionarily. You know, you're mate seeking, you're trying to establish yourself, you're trying to show some power, some risk taking, you know, there's, so I think that that's normal. And then over time, you know, narcissism, at least grandiose narcissism seems to go down. I think vulnerable probably does this too, but I'm not sure. I don't think anyone's looked at that yet, but uh, people uh. become less neurotic as they get older. They usually stabilize a little bit. Um, so I think the general pattern is towards some sort of stability over time. Well, that's um, reassuring. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you go, go to an old folk, go to a show at an old folks hall. You'll <laughs> see a bunch of, I mean, people are pretty happy, you know, when they get older. And uh, I mean, because you have, I mean, those life demands change and kids are a big part of it. But there are a lot of things go into it. But, but there's a progression of personality over life. Now, this may change generationally, too. So, you know, personality can change over time it can change across generation it can be different across culture but the general pattern i think is narcissism goes down as you age um and the fame thing is really interesting because there's this idea of fame as a bit of a drug and um you know i think i think the what's interesting is probably some people get a taste of it and really really like it now i don't i don't know i don't hang out talking about fame with famous people but i'm maybe some people really like it like fame is kind of a dopamine you know just kind of like fancy cocaine and maybe some people are like oh this is sick man what am i doing yeah. <laughs> and yeah i don't know i i um yeah. yeah, I definitely feel a little stuck, <laughs> or I did, because I was like, well, this is, I'm certainly better at this than I would be anything else in life, but I find it embarrassing. How can I make what I do more meaningful? <laughs> and and yeah. that's kind of what I've tried to use my platform to. Uh, you know. Yeah, and when we've done research on like grandiose narcissism and fame seeking, that they correlate, you know, status seeking, except reality television, you get higher narcissism scores because it's it makes sense. You want status, mm -hmm. and if and but 
I had a grad student once, we had a paper that got a lot of attention. She did. And I said, well, just enjoy the fame ride. And I remember the first day, she's like, this is awesome. I'm talking to all these people. And the day two, she starts getting the hate mail. She's like, this is awful. And I'm like, yeah, but you know now. You know fame kind of sucks. You get crazy emails. You know, money is better, but no one offers you that. <laughs> they offer you yeah. attention. You're like, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, so let, let's talk about how you go about testing some of these things. Cause, cause this'll, I think this will be a nice way of also kind of giving, uh, listeners that haven't, um, haven't, haven't maybe taken one of these tests, just, just a little, a, a little bit of a taste of, of some of the questions that you might expect. So I'm, I'm just pulling up from your book. I know there's a lot of different ways of, of yeah. There's a lot of different tests. I'm pulling up the MPI 13, and um, and so I'll I'll just I'll give an example of of a couple, and then I want to one of the things that I'm curious about is, and I'm probably going to over display my extreme openness uh, and and like my my um, I, I love just being a wash in ambiguity because so many of these things I sit in him and ha and go like, yeah. well, in this particular environment, I guess I'm like this and I could look at yeah. it this way. And then on the, on the other hand, so I'll, I'll maybe do that for one of these, um, uh, uh, just to kind of make a point and then, and then we'll just list off a couple uh, and then, and then let's just talk about these tests generally. Um, uh, the, maybe pros and cons where where there's some shortcomings where they work well um so so for example it, it'll be like you know a simple one will be my body is nothing special a or b i uh, i like to look at my body i'd put a my body is nothing special i've always had a bit of some insecurities tied around that as i get older i don't seem to care too much anymore so if there was if it was a sliding scale i definitely yeah. wouldn't be on any extreme end but right, if it was be right a or B, the... i'd be like yeah. oh, okay nothing special one uh, the first one is i i find it easy to manipulate people um uh, that's the first what b is i don't like it when i find myself manipulating people that's like that for example is an exceptionally difficult one for me to answer because i do like if i get pulled over by a police officer i'm getting out of that t like i am very good at getting i have a lead foot i get pulled over all the time maybe it's just experience but I, you know i've had uh, from early on in my life i was i i was uh, i was dealing drugs in high school and stuff i got i got i got good at training those muscles i was i was i i, I was used to uh like i said cheating in school breaking um uh pushing boundaries getting away with things and at the same time being a very genuine, authentic person is one of the single most important things to me. So I could certainly turn it on in a pinch, um, but I I would think that I'm overly cautious to I I find my I use a lot of disclaimers just to make sure that I'm not manipulating people right. which there is a disclaimer effect so maybe that that's also another way in which i'm subconsciously uh, <laughs> uh manipulating people but i just wanted to say as an example of of how many ways you can look at yeah. this like this is seemingly i i guess one of the points i'm making is this is seemingly so oversimplified yet these can be really reliable measures in in studies yeah, so I'll, I mean, this is so a couple of a bunch of things. One is the NPI, the narcissistic personality inventory, is kind of the classic old school narcissism measure that, that works. It's kind of like that, the, the, you know, it's not the best, it's not the prettiest, but darn it, it kind of works in the rain or snow or whatever. Um, it was designed with a forced choice format, and the idea was both of these items were supposed to be equally desirable. Like they both, you could, yeah, they both are sort of equally socially desirable. Like, you know, it's one isn't sort of the obvious wrong answer or the right answer. 
they did that to stop socially desirable, socially desirable spot responding, which people thought was a big issue in the 60s and 70s. It's really not a big issue. We can do the NPI 13, and I could have just given you those items and said one to five, agree, disagree, or you know, mm. completely not at all, or uh, completely, and it would work just as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's we've actually we've done this. Other people have done it. So it's this is kind of an old school scale, but that's what you're running into is the design to be one like, into both. Plus, you overthink everything. So you're like, I can imagine a time when I literally would kill my mom. You know, it would be dark, but, you know, imagine that. And and so, but most people are like, yeah, I wouldn't. Why would I do that? It's insane. I can't, I don't like to manipulate people. You know, so there could be something where you're just, there's a variable that's, that's kind of important in psychology, especially attitudes called need for cognition. Yeah. It, which is a trait of some people at very high, it's related to openness where they just need to think about stuff a lot. Mm-hmm. And my, and so high need for cognition, you overthink every damn question, you know, and you probably got some of that too. I mean, I, 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 I I'm not a finisher. I always have a bunch of books open. <laughs> I always yeah. have lots of projects, lots of ideas, <laughs> never disciplined enough to finish anything. <laughs> well, it's it's just, but that's just the that's just a certain wiring. But but so that probably makes these questions a little harder to answer because you're thinking more than the average bear about okay. them. You know, I, like I, I remember one of the personality tests I took a long time ago was uh, w- there was a question: Would you punch your dad for a joke? And I was like. <laughs> Of course I would punch my dad for a joke. Are you kidding me? Like, not for, if, if you, I mean, what are we talking about here? Is he in on it? Am I just cold clocking my dad out of nowhere? Yeah. Like, there's nothing funny about that. If I'm just sucker punching my dad <laughs> malicious. But if this is like a sketch that we're doing, like, of course I, why wouldn't I punch my yeah. <laughs> Does my dad yeah. also think it's funny? <laughs> Too many considerations. <laughs> so there's a couple ways you build questionnaires. And one is face validity, where you just go, okay, does this item make sense on the face of it like you know i like to look at myself in the mirror it's probably a measure of vanity it makes sense another way they develop these questionnaires is uh say criterion keen but basically you just see what correlates it's almost like machine learning but old school uh-huh. and so you end up with items like i prefer showers or baths i like tall women these items that you just go, what the heck is this <laughs> supposed to be measuring? And so like the MMPI, which is a very kind of traditional, classic clinical measure, you know, from, from Minnesota, um, they have all these items that just make no sense on the face of them at all. But they seem to predict, you know, they tend to be able to select people between different disorders or different conditions, but they're just weird items. Mm. So I, I haven't finished the book. It's fantastic. I'm a such an embarrassingly slow reader. I'm actually I I've, I've been letting myself off the hook for that because I I I I I read and write at the same time and I really think about th- as I'm reading about but it takes me forever to get through a book. Um but I I just I only say that just so I'm not asking something that that would seem obvious had I finished it. Um uh, but one of the things is for for listeners um, where uh, you you have you have a site right where people can take a bunch of different- oh yeah um, Carolyn uh, my co-author is much smarter and better at journalism and stuff and she did a site narcissismlab.com and we have the MPI in there we have a hypersensitive narcissism scale which measures vulnerable narcissism I think I put an entitlement measure on there. Um, and it, and you don't have to go to my site. I mean, there's you can Google plenty of these measures and go find the papers and you know download them and do it. None of this stuff is a is a state secret. I mean, these scales are out there. Uh, the way personality works is people come up with scales, then we kind of rethink what we're constructed. What does narcissism really mean? Then we come up with another scale, and we kind of then we have fights over whose scales better, and we refine the scales, and so we end up with these you know a bunch of different measures that kind of look at things a little bit differently, but all go together and, and they're out there for people. Mm. Um, how accurate 
are these self reports in your way of thinking about it? I think self report measures are wonderful, excuse mm -hmm. me, are wonderful for looking at large samples of people. So if I want to understand how narcissism is related to a variable Y with a sample of a couple hundred people, I can get really reliable and valid assessments. Mm -hmm. and, and this is true for a lot of personality measures. We're just very good at doing this. But if you ask the question, is this good for like diagnostic reasons? No, these are not designed as clinical measures. These are designed for, for use in big samples. And when I say samples, I always, like I said, I always want a couple hundred people because that's what it seems to take to stabilize a lot of correlations. Mm. So we look, but, but the measures we have, I mean, science is in shambles right now, but personality works. If you, if you grabbed a sample of 200 people right now and gave them a narcissistic personality inventory and a Rosenberg self-esteem inventory, I guarantee the correlation would be between 2-2 two, two and 3-2 or maybe probably 2-7. So they're, wow. they're really good. I mean, yeah. we kind of know what we're doing with these measures because we've been doing it for 100 years and people are pretty open about it and we've, we've got them dialed in pretty well. But they're not, they're not laser beams. You know, we, mm -hmm. we predict 10% of behavior. It's not, it's not magic, but we can do it well. Um, so for me, I think that one of the... Oh man, there's so many things that I love about personality research, but but one in terms of understanding others more um, uh, has has helped tremendously. I here's something that that would put me maybe a little more toward the narcissistic side is is I do I do find myself getting pretty frustrated with humans uh generally and uh, um and uh often thinking that like i'm smarter than they are i catch myself yeah. and i'm like i i find out from doing this podcast each and every week i get on i talk with a scientist i'm like oh no i'm so dumb i don't know i i have no business talking with, with, with people that are specialists in anything um but you know, I, I tend to, I tend to, uh, I have a history of being super judgmental of kind of tribal, uh, anything, whether that's like rooting for sports teams, thinking your country is the best, any, anything like that. I tend to, you know, any group thinky type stuff. I tend to just think that I'm usually, uh, a little smarter than that person. I don't. I don't intellectually think that's the case. I just am mindful enough to find myself like feeling that and judging. And one of the things that's helped is learning about things like, um, like in the personality research thing that I did. I had uh, they they were talking about need for closure, and that was one of the things that was like. Like I, I have this person in my life that in high school we were like so similar and I went off and had this big adventure. They didn't yeah. and like stayed in their hometown and we kind of grew apart and, and to overly simplify things, you know, he, he became more and more conservative. I became more and more liberal, uh, so liberal. I hate calling myself liberal because I don't want to put a thing in my uh, a label on myself and this and that. But, um, uh, but it's, but I notice when, whenever we hang out or talk, I notice that like, we're so, so similar in so many aspects and he's a bright, really bright guy. And, and the one, uh, huge difference is that like need for closure, boom, really snap judgments from him. Every time I'm always like, Oh, well, let's look at this in five other five other ways and i realized i'm i'm super judgmental of people that are very high in need for closure and that's mm -hmm. something that's helped me go wait a second this is like just a neurologic thing yeah before you judge people for that hold on a second and and so i i, I just i think that if 
more people knew about personality research, they would know so much more about themselves and their family, their friends, their relationships. I think the world would be such a better place. I, I do too. And especially just something as simple as the big five, as simple, but it's, it's just those traits. I, I think one of those profound lessons I had were that, was that people are different from me. Mm -hmm. So when I was young, I just assumed everyone should be like me. I was kind of yeah. standard. You just kind of put me up there. And then if people didn't line up, they were different degrees of flawed to my standard. And I still have some of that, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I realized over time, like, you know, maybe it's not me. And when I was in this leadership thing doing the Myers-Briggs of all things. And I'm like, as a personality psychologist, we like hate the Myers-Briggs. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I mean, I, I don't, but I mean, it's kind of the thing. And so I was doing it and they said, everyone get in the other side of the room. So I'm, I'm on the intuitive side and one, all the way on one side and the sensing people on the other side. And I looked at them and they all looked at me with such hatred. Mm -hmm. And all they thought were, all they thought were, if you would just follow my rules, everything would work. And I looked at them and I thought, if you would just stop making all these stupid freaking rules, everything would work. <laughs> yeah. And we were both saying, you know, we were both, <laughs> we were both right, you know, yeah. but it was such a revelation for me because I just like to blow stuff up. You know, that's just how I'm wired. And these guys are like, just make it work. Just make it please for the love of God. Follow the manual. We got three thirty thousand people. We need a freaking manual, you idiot. And they're right, you know, right. but so I, I think to me that just seeing that people are different and just, and I think a, about a lot of personality is goal directed, that people have needs. So people who are open like me, I just need novelty. I like new stuff, even if it's good. I just like it. I just mm -hmm. need it. I need to travel. I need adventure. That's how I'm wired. I need to, I'm extroverted. Um, but I don't need to order that much. Things don't work on time. I'm not going to go crazy, you know, if, you know, if a snake gets in the house, I'm not that fearful. I can catch a snake. It's not that big a deal. I mean, I can get along with people. I don't have to be that friends. I'm just not wired that way. Mm -hmm. Other people are like adventure is terrible, but they really want some order. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we just want order. And I, if things are ordered, I feel great. I just want it to work, man. I just want the machines <laughs> working. And that's what they want. Yeah. And like, I can respect that. Like, but I need to think a little bit outside my own ego to go, you know, that's how your world is. Other people are just relational. They're just like, I just want people to get along. I just want mm -hmm. them to cooperate. I don't care about order as long as we're all the, in this together. I don't care if the turkey's burned, you mm -hmm. know, as long as we're at Thanksgiving. And I'm like, I'd rather eat a goose or a turducken because that sounds cool. I've never seen one of those because I'm so it, open. And then the yeah, other person's yeah. like, I just want it to work. It never works. <laughs> yeah. and I get drunk. And, but you know what I mean? So I think yeah. about these things as kind of, ways we regulate and it, it makes me appreciate a little bit that people are different you know yeah we're all we all got egos man we all think we're better narcissism is kind of one example of it but we all mm. get stuck in our own game and uh and it I, makes us feel good and safe and and it cuts us off in the world i mean i i think that this is another valuable tool of even even self-reports even if you're never going to tell anyone i know in myself now, I, would, I wouldn't say that this is equated to a tremendous amount of successful change, but, but I have always known I was disorganized and uh, a slob, uh, but, but seeing how low my score was when I took the test and it just made me think, yeah. you know... This has screwed up so many of my relationships with women, and and and, and you know you know if you're low for a guy because you already get yeah, bumped, you get low. you get points. <laughs> they they bump they give you some extra points if you're a male, right? And in, in in the conscientiousness scales to like balance it, like like not if, not when you well, I don't if they norm it, the norm would be different, but I don't think they give you any secret. I mean, how would they know? Because don't you fill out if you're male or female? And, and, and uh, we it, don't use those it, when we determine oh. a score. Like we don't cook that in. We'd use oh, that afterwards okay. as kind of a covariate or you know okay. do group comparison. But we don't we don't usually we don't internally do an adjustment. Ah, typically, I mean, you could build something like that. But yeah, but um, but no, but but 
Because males are typically males bit. are lower, so low. I mean, so, you know, low conscientious males. Pretty, it's the dude. Yeah, know, that's, that's kind <laughs> so, of right. so. It made me, you know, it was kind of like it was. It was almost like a a, a smoker that always knew like. I shouldn't be hacking up my lung and smoking yeah. two packs a day or whatever, but like that final, like getting the diagnosis or whatever was yeah. like enough of, and, and that was, that was something uh, for me that made me go, I need to consciously work on this quite a bit more. And oh, I exercise more since then and just other, other stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's totally normal. Uh, personality is, you know, most of us, we want to be somewhere in the middle of traits. And, and so when I teach this class back before the pandemic, when I could teach 250 people at a time, I'd say, you know, who wants to be more conscientious? You get, you know, half the class wants to be more conscientious. Mm -hmm. Like who wants to be less conscientious? And I get two people. You know, they're yeah. just like, I, I'm, I'm workaholic, I'm just too, you know, too hypercritical, I'm just too driven, I want to loosen up. And so there's a balance, and we have disorders at both ends. You know, you have disorders of impulsivity, and, and obviously things like, you know, economic hardship and relational problems that go with that. But you can have disorders with too much conscientiousness as well, where it kind of bleeds into neuroticism, you become too perfectionistic. Hmm. So you know, there's a middle ground, but yeah, if you're too extreme, especially if you can't control it, if you can't dial it in in a relationship or something, then it then might be something to look at. Mm. Well, not to perpetuate the uh, false dichotomy of nature versus nurture too much or whatever, but uh, um, or somewhat fall overrated. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but uh, you know, my my mom is the most conscientious person I've ever met. Exceptionally organized. She, and she, I've never met, like, like, you know, when I was a little kid, she was, she was always the most, the cleanest, most organized person. And to this day, she's still, she's still like taking, uh, uh, you, you know, if we talk, she's like, oh, I've, I found this new show about organizing on Netflix or whatever and finding it. It's like, it's like the difference between how organized you are and the most organized person in the planet is like just a sliver. And, and, but you're still like just going for it, wanting to be that much more organized than every. And the, the reason I bring it up is how much, I, I I often wonder is this because like I was raised in this upbringing where uh, yeah. and at the same time I was exceptionally rebellious and this was just this very obvious thing for me to rebel against. Yeah, I also being from Wisconsin would root for whoever was playing against the Packers. I would also make fun of the Catholic Church or what it, it didn't matter. You could have put me in any any situation. I think you could have dropped me anywhere in the planet and I would have been like, you know what? I like the state or country next door more. What do you think about that? <laughs> you know, so I, would have, just... I would have been a button pusher no matter so what. So that's really interesting. So the argument then is that the master trait is something like antagonism or oppositional. I mean, I think so. Or, or maybe reactance, you know, the idea that I don't want anyone to control me. And if that's the trait, then what you end up doing, of course, is letting everybody control you, but just to kind of <laughs> yeah, universe, exactly, you know, exactly. you know, you just they all you just on a different <laughs> yeah. kind of leash. It's um, it's another one of those, much like much like my fame revelation. That that's been one of the embarrassing things in life of just like, oh, you just have to you be a contrarian in every you're so yeah. predictable, thinking that you're not predictable. I, um, I, I, I have a lot of those traits too. I just, I end up that sort of defiance and like, you can't tell me what to do. And it, and it, and it's silly, but what I've realized is after a lifetime of beating myself up for being such an idiot, I realized that growth is essentially being realizing you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah. And that's what all growth is your entire life. It's realizing you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah. And at some point I just got to embrace that instead of saying, man, you're such an idiot. Because uh -huh. this happens to me all the time. I'm like, how did you, 
how did you not know this? How did you go from, I mean, I'm 55, 54. How did you go through 30 years being such an idiot? You know, I'm like, well, because that's growth. There's also that amazing psychological thing that you can, that you can go from, uh, what, what's the, What's that idea in science where where any any new idea goes from like you're crazy to highly contested to that Everyone. was obvious all, of, uh, all all along there's I think uh, I think I I'm going to butcher this I'll just paraphrase I don't remember what the joke was but but the premise uh Doug Stanhope um one of my favorite comics speaking of unconscientious um rebellious button pushers he um he he has some very self-aware <laughs> joke of like he's like i'll i'll learn something and within an hour i'll be yelling at everyone else for not knowing the thing <laughs> that i just learned <laughs> an yeah. hour ago but we do that with ourselves too yes yes <laughs> yeah but i mean yeah i i yeah i i don't even know where i'm going with this but it i it's growth it's you're always improving and and the process is you're just going to always be a failure i mean yeah. that's it and and and, the, and success is the same way you know i've always said like your goal is to be the dumbest for me it's to be the dumbest one at the table I, yeah. I, I knew I made it when I was sitting around dinner, a bunch of social personality psychologists. I'm like, God, who the hell invited me? And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, I peaked. This is good. <laughs> yeah. So like success is kind of a downer. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. There's, there's the other, um, I, I remember, I don't know how true this is. I think I, I think it was a book called oh shoot ah it, it was some book about changing behavior on neuroplasticity ah i think it was called the brain that changes itself or something like that anyway there was something about people people that are um the leaders the, like the academics that are the leaders in their field had the highest rates of uh of like alzheimer's and and things like that later on in life the reasoning potentially being that one they got so you know it's usually they were at the top of the field because they were in such a specific niche that they didn't uh they weren't doing as much like interdisciplinary stuff so so they were like fine tuning their knowledge more than you know broadening yeah. and then the other thing was no one questioned them yes yeah. yeah so you're getting that real i mean that's what i always say about ego that it's very easy to make a world where you just no one questions you it's just a very very small world yeah you know you made a very small box oh that's interesting i don't know that um but i don't know, even say, know that it's true it's what it's done in one it's book true, but it sounds but good it sounds great <laughs> but there's there's kind of you know the academics are kind of the more the more you know frenetic big thinkers bouncing ideas around never get things put together and then there are people that are super focused super uh -huh. you know direct driven they're both ways to be successful you know uh -huh. kind of boxes and hedgehogs in a way and mm. um but they're different strategies. Foxes and hedgehogs. I've never heard that one before. Well, it's, a, it's the idea that, the, that the, uh, the fox knows a lot of little things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Oh. If I get that backwards. So th this comes yeah. in. It, it's how people organize knowledge. And it goes, there's this idea of a red thread that I think Confucius and Freud talked about. But the idea is some people have all their knowledge is linked. Yeah. So we start talking about something, I can link it to something else, and I can link it to the posters on your wall. Mm -hmm. Other people's knowledge, they know a lot of, you know, they, they, they know like a lot of little details about stuff. So they know a whole bunch about this, a whole bunch about this, but it's not as linked. 
Mm. You know, it's kind of more like little bits. And, it's like forest and trees is another way to people. Some people are more focused on forests and some are more focused on trees. Mm-hmm. And so there are these different levels of analysis and thinkers kind of end up, you know, and there's even ca- career trajectories. You know, you look at them, people often start, you know, Freud started out looking at neurons, like specific neurons, I think in a squid. Mm-hmm. And at the end of his career, he's writing, you know, civilization is discontent, it's trying to understand war and the nature of man and, and, you know, sort of shame and how we're d- wired to, you know, what we have to give up for civilization. It's, so his career to that trajectory, Jung, you know, was started out talking, I mean, he was doing like, I mean, he did like basic word association experiments and then it ended up with this weird stuff, you know, cultural work. So people, well, he did a lot of cultural work well, in the middle. Um, so that pattern is pretty common too, where people mm. go from small to like me in my career. I do all sorts of weird stuff. And I don't I, care. I would rather be a C student in as many possible uh, 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 subjects as as, uh, as I possibly can than to be a, a student in uh, in a couple. Yeah, and it's and it's hard. And what happens in science is it's a team sport. It's Mm -hmm. not something you can really, you know, for me to do work, I end up talking to a bunch of people and sorry, somebody knows some stats and somebody knows some theory and somebody knows some, you know, bio and we're all working together. I couldn't do it on my own. You know, it's just really hard. And so we end up with different specialties, you know, kind of building teams or squads that take on these projects. I'm I'm curious uh, how much I... I'm wondering what your take is on the rates of of um, of narcissism in academia compared to other things, like say, because because to me the kind of embodiment of narcissism is like um, or grandiose narcissism is like the big shot, the CEO, the the president, you know, whatever, and and science does seem a lot more cooperative i i was just i've been um i've been sitting in on uh um on a class and uh of, of uh robert sapolsky's and he was talking about how um alzheimer's researchers are the worst uh because because there's so much ride it there there's some like who whoever whoever gets a breakthrough is going to be like the most famous scientist on earth so there's like conniving and cheating and and hiding data and fudging data and all of these things that you don't see in that many other disciplines and then he he used an example of of uh of of a particular lab uh, he's like never be in a lab like this where where it was he he broke everyone uh, the the lab had broke up everyone into teams and it was like whoever figures this out gets first author on the paper you know everyone else is kind of the lo- and he's like never work in a lab like that it, it, it doesn't work it, it it'll end to, or it can work but you're going to be miserable and i've i've always I'm a big board gamer. I like cooperative games uh, the most, yeah. like the game Pandemic, for example, is a really, really good one and appropriate right now. But I've always thought with sports and uh, and everything else, I've never felt that same level of. I've always felt like the zero sum um, perception of reality didn't jive well with like humans are such a cooperative oh, yeah. uh, species, and and this idea that there's a winner and a loser has never made sense to. And I've never cared about. Winning in the, like I've been playing pickleball this summer, uh, which is old man tennis. Um, and for the it's like on a shorter tennis court for people I've never heard of the dumbest sounding sport ever. And whether I win or lose, I don't what when I like hit a really nice hit or have like a fantastic serve, that's what does it for me. Last night I was on Twitch playing uh playing this game code names it's this word association game and it's in teams or whatever and and uh you give a clue and your partner tries to guess as many words as possible and when it comes to games i 
Like I'm, I'm talking smack and stuff like that, but I don't care if I win or lose. What drives me crazy is one, if someone, if someone cheats and two, when, when someone, um, makes like some horrifically bad, like logical error, like, like, like when there's a simple, even when they're on the other team or whatever, I'm just like, why would you, why would you think that like it frustrates me? But I think that I'm, I think I'm in the minority in this. It seems like, it seems like so many people are just into viewing life as winning and losing. And maybe, maybe they're, they have a better way of looking at it, but I'm, I'm curious if that, I'm, I'm curious if that tends to lead to more neuroticism. If you'd see more neuroticism in, in like, uh, sports or see than you would in like an academic, more cooperative environment. Well, I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to kind of unpack there. But the, all my questions are way uh, too long winded. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of good a, material, man. Take a stab at whatever you I'm like. Just gonna, I'll, just just pick the part, I'll just pick the carcass <laughs> yeah. apart a little bit. So a few things. One is competition in teams is something people generally like because you're working with the team. So you're kind of buffered from this, from failure a little bit and you get to celebrate with success. So that's something people like that to, to be on the teams in competition. Um, but, but science itself, like a lot of things, it's a combination of cooperation and competition. So we're kind of like cooperating in the field to make the field work, but then we're always brawling to like fighting over ideas like the narcissism measures. I mean, we fight, you know, mine's better than yours. And we have these brawls and some people take them seriously. And other people, I mean, I tend to be more like Hollywood frenemies, you know, I'd rather just like have fake enemies just for drama. I don't, I like people. <laughs> yeah. um, but you get in the world of big money uh, science, grant funded funding lines are something five ten percent meaning you submit 10 grants to get one funded or 20 grants people be, and your job depends on getting a grant funded people become incredibly competitive and that's where you see i mean the system is it's i won't say it's broken but it's not a real healthy system mm. and a lot of that big money science and Unfortunately, after the pandemic, university is going to be so broke, you know, they're going to put all their eggs in big money science. Not to say there's not great work and great people, but it gets super, super competitive and it's labs fighting labs. And what happens in some of these fields is these dominant ideas have a lot of money behind them and people don't want to give them up. Mm. You know, for me, I can give up. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I've already had a career. I can say whatever I want. It's awesome. I'm like liberated. But, you know, you're young, yeah. you're fighting. It, it can get pretty dark in academics. Oh, huh. interesting. Um, so let's say you get a self assess. Uh, you, you, you take a bunch of, you take some personality tests, you take some neuroticism tests, then you're like, okay, now I'm going to go to a therapist. Hey therapist, here's where I test on all of these things. Would a therapist actually benefit from hearing someone's self-report, or would would they be like, ah, I'll judge that for myself? Why? I I think the challenge is that in personality science, we use the big five, and it works great. And in clinical science or in clinical practice, they use a different diagnostic system, which involves personality disorders and mental illness, essentially, like depression or anxiety or narcissism or borderline. So they're using a different system. These two systems link up pretty well, meaning that you can use the big five and you can come up with something that looks like the clinical system. And there's models that do this. If any, you have any nerds out there listening, just Google the high top model is one, but there's others. So you can basically frame a lot of the clinical disorders in terms of the big five. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, it's super easy to communicate big five terms because I'm very used to that. And you can do it, but that transition hasn't been made. If you open the new DSM-5 and you look up narcissism, it's in there in two places, along with all the personality disorders, because they have one version that was done without the big five, and then they made another version with a new big five, they call the PID-5, which is for clinical conditions, but it's kind of the same big five. 
So they made up that new diagnostic system, but then there was such political pushback, they didn't use it. So it's in the back of the DSM-5 as an emerging sort of model that may or may not be looked at. Mm. So what you're hitting on is like, yeah, we should be talking to each other. We should be sharing this language, but um, it's, uh, it's hard to do it, because it just politically is going to take a while. Are are uh, are narcissistic people prone to ever finding that out about themselves? People that are extremely yes, but it's it's one of those things where I mean, just personally, I'll get you know ten or twenty or a hundred emails from somebody saying my partner, my mom, my kid, my whatever is narcissistic than myself. Mm -hmm. But I do get people. And people talk to me and say, you know, I've got issues. I see a problem. In the research we've done, uh, it seems that people who are narcissistic can be aware of it, especially the problem they have with antagonism. They go, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of messing up my relationships. I see a problem. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's sometimes people look at a, a loving family and go, that looks pretty good. You know, I mean, I love my fame and it's kind of cool to do, you know, go to Vegas or whatever, but like that looks kind of nice too. And so I, I think there's some awareness and people, um, right, there is some awareness. It's just mm. not everybody. And, and narcissism, you know, I'd say people have disorders in it and it's hard to change. Even when you have, you're depressed, you're anxious, no one wants to be depressed or anxious, but it's hard to change. If you're narcissistic and you feel pretty good and your self-esteem's self high, changing is not necessarily, you're just not as motivated to do it. So that makes it kind of doubly hard. But if you want to change, I think it's I think it's possible for people to change. I think it's possible for people to change in all the big five traits. So vo vulnerable narcissism would would probably be the one more apt to want to. Right, want and that's why you get more vulnerable narcissism in therapy, I and see. that's why we had the difference, and that's why we have these two versions because people that were in therapists saw narcissism like these people are insecure. And Deep down, they're at, you know they're in, deflated inside and empty, and then people in organizational psych and personality it's like these arrogant people, and they're just fucking crushing it. And they're deep down; they don't hate themselves at all. Mm -hmm. So we had these two different fields looking at this trait and seeing two different people because of where they were finding them. Mm -hmm. You know, we we you know when you select narcissists in therapy, you're getting a lot of depression and deflation and low self esteem. Just kind of a weird, you know, that's where the history was weird. Interesting. So outside of, um, a few, I, I, I posted a thing on Instagram live yesterday asking for questions, which, which helped, uh, helped me come up with, um, what I thought some of the listeners would be interested in the most. And, and, uh, within that, I would, I I made a joke about you know I was like hey get it holidays are coming get it get this for the narcissist in, in your life you probably don't want to gift this to a narcissist you might want to gift this to someone that you know has to deal with a narcissist yes. all of the time right so yes so what because I I wanted to ask two things one is. If you are a narcissist and you want, uh, other than going to therapy, which, or, and maybe is is that even? Do you consider that the most important thing for a, a narcissist uh, that wants help? Or I think, I mean, I think therapy is great. Go for yeah. it. But I think there's a lot of things people can do, you know, and and um, a lot of it is just figuring out what the specific issues are that you have that are kind of your 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 hot buttons maybe mm. and just working on those yourself so like for me a lot of times it's entitlement or sometimes uh i'll go to conferences and i talk over people because i'm just so ex i'm like hey i like your idea let me make it better and put it in 10, ten dimensions and tell you about it and they're like shut up you know but I'm like, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. so it's you know a lot of, sometimes you notice that like you, you just kind of make this conscious effort over time to be a little bit so you can really work on really specific things like that um, a lot of gratitude's a real good practice for entitlements. Um, 
with with something like turn taking and conversations you can just you know do real simple cognitive behavioral things like i'm going to be sure to listen to everybody you know ask everybody i meet how their day was mm. um you can do like loving kindness meditations if you want to work more on empathy a little bit those have some effect so they're different uh different um sort of techniques you can use to work on different issues if that's something you want to do amazing now what about someone that has dealing with the narcissist they they want to um they so, someone that they work with someone that you know maybe they're significant to other a, a parent a child something yeah um something like that uh, where they they want to understand may, maybe not even necessarily how to like change that person as it's probably not yeah. the easiest thing in the world but they want to understand how to how to cope or manage that situation yeah i i think um one thing i like to talk about is sort of the same idea is that somebody who's narcissistic maybe has a really kind of inflated self-opinion but is also maybe a little mean or a little bit callous in how they deal with people and, and can be really bad too. And if it's really bad, protect yourself, get the hell out. I just, I don't want to leave that unsaid. But for the more average things, I think focus on the specifics and frame it in terms of, you know, the narcissist ego. So, hey, if you spend more time with the grandkids, they really love you. And, you know, you'd be such a better grand, you'd be such a great granddad. That's what great granddads do. You're so smart. I bet, you know, the kids would love <laughs> So you're, you're kind nice. of trying to align ego with compassion or at least interpersonal warmth or something. And that interpersonal piece seems to be where a lot of the difficulties come from. Like we can handle people who are arrogant if they're kind of nice or they're harmless. You know, we can tolerate that. But people who are mean or callous, they're, they're less, you know, people who steal credit from us or, you know, that's not as that's more toxic. So those are usually the areas that need the most work. Mm. Um, so sort of focus on that try not to make it so you, you're a, you're a narcissist i hate you but like yeah hey, you're, you get we got a lot going on here that's really great let's maybe do this and make it even better ah uh, yeah interesting um awesome well is there is there any other um takeaways or anything that you want to leave people with from this conversation or anything that you want people to know about your book uh, another reason hopefully people are buying this book anyway it's fantastic i i think that you probably enjoyed this conversation if you didn't i'm off in what makes this podcast good because this was i absolutely love this stuff i just can't get enough yeah. of it. it it's just this is life itself this is the human experience and learning more about it i don't know why anyone wouldn't be interested in in this stuff so it was fun to geek out about personality a little bit i, I just i went a little deeper which is really cool awesome man so interesting so interesting well maybe uh maybe once i get through which i'm actually going to i'll finish usually i i move on to the next thing to ready myself for the next interviews and so on but I, i'm gonna finish this book so maybe i'll hit you up again um uh, so, sometime and we'll spread it out and do it in you know early next year or something so you get another bump and we remind people about the book again i'll be fun i love this this is a great conversation awesome well terrific keith cabell everybody uh check out his book the new science of narcissism understanding one of the greatest psychological challenges of our time and what you can do about it uh maybe plug the website oh uh narcissismlab.com wkeithcampbell.com is me awesome well thank you keith for joining me this is really terrific thanks and thank you listeners for being such wonderful interesting curious people we'll talk with you next week